Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining our data, uh, privacy data event. Uh, we have close to a thousand people tuning in this morning from across the entire country. I also want to thank my team for the tremendous amount of work they've put into organizing this event. I'm truly grateful to work alongside such a dedicated group of professionals. Bonjour à nos collègues francophones et bienvenue. Pour ceux et celles qui préfèrent suivre la discussion en français, veuillez s'il vous plaît cliquer sur « Passer au français » à droite de l'écran pour une traduction simultanée de l'événement. For more than three decades, my office, the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, has provided oversight of Ontario's access and privacy laws. These laws set out the rules for how Ontario's public institutions, healthcare providers, and child and family service providers may collect, use, and disclose personal information and how they must keep that information secure. These laws also provide the public with the right of access to government-held information and access to their own personal information. When individuals believe that their privacy and access rights have been contravened, they may complain or appeal to our office and we will take action to ensure compliance with the laws. But in addition to our enforcement role, we have a broader public education mandate, which is what brings us together today. Every year, my office hosts an event to commemorate Data Privacy Day, which is observed around the world to raise awareness about data protection and promote privacy best practices. And I can think of no better way to celebrate this year than by focusing on how we can better support and empower our new generation of digital citizens. Children are growing up more and more connected, using more of their own mobile devices, sharing more personal information through social media platforms, and at younger and younger ages. And the time spent online daily is also increasing, especially since COVID has forced many of us, including our children and youth, to live, work, and play, and study online almost full time school, medical appointments, social functions, and even extracurricular activities like music and dance lessons are all online now. Soon our children and youth may be all living in the metaverse, a form of virtual interactive reality. The question is, are children equipped with the skills they need to develop healthily and thrive in this new digital world? A young person's digital identity portrayed by what they put out there and what others may post about them has huge impact on their present and future lives. Everything done or said online leaves an indelible mark. Once information is posted on the internet, it can be collected, replicated, and used by others without knowledge or consent, and control over it can be lost for good. Despite their natural curiosity and sense of invincibility, young people often aren't aware or at least fully aware of how their personal information is actually being collected and used. They may not be aware of the privacy risks that loom out there every time they go on online, including offensive, illegal and fake content, bullies, predators and identity thieves, increased tracking and surveillance of their behavior, monetization of their personal information and online activities, the use of algorithms to nudge their purchasing behavior or change their attitudes about things and influence their decisions that may have long-term consequences on their life choices and opportunities. Not to mention the negative impacts that participating in the digital world can have on children's physical and mental health. According to the Wall Street Journal's investigative series, The Facebook Files, about one in three or 32% of teenage girls who felt bad about their bodies said that using Instagram made them feel even worse. Teens, especially girls, also said social media compounded their struggles with problems relating to eating disorders, self-harm and suicidal thoughts. Globally, over the past decade, there is growing recognition and concern that children's privacy, autonomy, and well-being are increasingly at risk in the evolving digital world. Hearing these risks as parents and educators, 
our first protective instinct might be to want to forbid them from going online or scare them from doing so. But I assure you that that will not be the takeaway from today's event. Without question, the digital environment offers real opportunities for young users. It can contribute to their education, to their access to information and leisure activities, to the expression of their opinions and thoughts, to the development of their curiosity and personality. It enables them to develop and maintain family and social relationships, especially now when social distancing can otherwise feel so isolating for so many of us. For all these positive reasons, it's essential to allow our children to participate in the digital world while also supporting them as they navigate through it. It's incumbent on all of us as parents, as educators and as regulators to promote the respect and protection of children's privacy rights while also empowering children to assert their own rights with knowledge and confidence. As stated in the UN General Comment on the Rights of the Child in Relation to the Digital Environment, privacy is essential for the empowerment, dignity, and safety of children and for the ex exercise of children's rights. Young people, like any other person, have the right to informational self-determination, which implies giving them a certain autonomy and control over their personal data. Not surprisingly, there's still much to understand about how we can better support our children and youth as they develop their sense of identity online, teach them about their rights and responsibilities, and help them develop into good digital citizens. And today is about working to advance that understanding. Today's theme of empowering a new generation of digital citizens is in line with one of my office's strategic priorities children and youth in a digital world. Our goal over the next four years is to champion the access and privacy rights of Ontario's children and youth by promoting their digital literacy and expansion of their digital rights, while also holding institutions accountable for protecting the children and youth they serve. To further this goal, we have in the past few months published Privacy Pursuit, a kid's activity book for children to learn about online privacy. Launched a webinar at the start of the school year on protecting student privacy rights in Ontario to add to a long line of existing privacy guidance for school, schools, parents, and teachers, including actual lesson plans. We issued our first two orders under part 10 of the Children, Youth, and Family Services Act that protects the privacy of children and youth in care. And we dedicated two episodes so far of our Info Matters podcast on the privacy of young children and another focused on teens, both of which are available on our website along with all of our other resources or wherever you get your podcasts. My office also works as a member of the Global Privacy Assembly, which is the global forum for data protection and privacy authorities from over 130 countries that provides international leadership on data protection and privacy efforts. Through our work with the assembly, we support the development of comprehensive and harmonized approaches to privacy and data protection on a global scale that informs and supports our office's work here in Ontario. As a member of GPA, our office co-sponsored an international resolution in October, 2021 to promote children's digital rights. This builds on an earlier international resolution adopted in 2016 to promote the adoption of an international competency framework on privacy education. To further the commitment we made in that resolution, our office, together with all of our federal, provincial, and territorial privacy commissioners across Canada, issued a joint letter urging the Council of Ministers of Education to include privacy as a clear and concrete component in digital literacy curricula across the country based on the competencies and skills set out in that international framework. The framework serves as a roadmap for educators outlining nine foundational privacy principles students ought to know and understand, including how to exercise their privacy rights and responsibilities 
as digital citizens. In addition, legislators around the world are introducing special protections for children's online privacy. For example, Europe's landmark privacy law, the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR, acknowledges that children merit special protection as they may be less aware of their personal information, um, risks and consequences, particularly when it comes to the use of their personal information for marketing or for creating personality or user profiles. Ontario's white paper on modernizing privacy in Ontario proposed a private sector privacy law that would include special protections to guard against the heightened dangers targeting children by introducing a minimum age for valid consent and prohibiting organizations from monitoring children for the purpose of influencing their decisions or behavior. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recently expanded the Convention on the Rights of the Child with a highly influential commentary and update on children's rights in the digital environment, including many recommendations to ensure that the best interest of the child are paramount. Data protection authorities, most notably in Europe, are creating guidelines and enforceable codes of, of practice to protect and empower children, such as the Children's Code developed by the UK Commissioner's Office, which we're gonna hear more about this morning. The eight recommendations to enhance the protection of children online developed by the French Data Protection Authority and the fundamentals for a child-focused approach to data processing recently published by the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. So clearly there's growing convergence around the importance, complexity, and urgency of the privacy issues impacting children's digital future and the need to address them by protecting them on the one hand and empowering them on the other in a manner consistent with their evolving level of development and maturity. To quote the great and inspiring Nelson Mandela, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And so with that inspiration, we begin. Joining us today are representatives from key stakeholder groups, including the Ministry of Education, an Ontario Teachers Association, a law professor and researcher from the University of Ottawa, the Director of Education of a Children's Advocacy Group, a best-selling author on community activism, the UK Data Protection Authority, and the Youth President of the Ontario Student Trustees Association. In the short time that we have available, I've asked these esteemed panelists to focus on three broad themes. How are children and youth experiencing the digital environment differently? And how can we both protect and empower them to think critically about their personal information? How can we integrate privacy education as a component of digital literacy programs in school curricula? And what is the role of laws, regulations, and other non-regulatory instruments like codes of conduct in protecting and promoting children's privacy rights? I hope you're gonna to find today's privacy panel to be informative and inspiring. I know I certainly will. I'm looking forward to it and with that, I'd like to turn over the screen to Eric Ward, our Assistant Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives and External Relations to introduce our panelists. Thank you and have a great event. Thanks so much, Commissioner Kosame, for that introduction. And as a privacy professional, but also as a parent, uh, watching young people living and learning in digital environments, what you've said reverberates very strongly for me. Now it's my pleasure to open our panel session and let me begin by introducing uh, Dr. Jane Bailey, a professor of law at the University of Ottawa and co-lead on the Equality Project. That's an initiative focused on young, young people's experiences with digital technologies and their impact of corporate profiling practices on young people and their relationships. Next is Keith Bebeon, who's a secondary uh, school student at Marshall McLuhan Catholic School. And what a great school name for someone who's interested in the digital lives of young people. And 
uh, Keith, where Keith serves as both a student trustee and as president of the Ontario Student Trustees Association. Keith, we're so glad to have you join us today. Anthony Karabash joins us from the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association, where he works as a provincial coordinator for additional qualifications courses. Anthony also conducts talks provincially and internationally about modern teaching techniques and believes in the power of technology to enhance teaching and learning rather than as a replacement of personal interactions that are so important in the development of critical digital citizens. We're also very pleased to have with us Assistant Deputy Minister responsible for the Student Achievement Division of the Ministry of Education in Ontario, Yael Ginsler. Yael holds a Bachelor of Education degree from McGill University and a Master of Education degree in Technology, Innovation and Education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Welcome, Yael. This event would not have been possible without the help of Matthew Johnson who's widely recognized as an expert in digital literacy and its implementation in Canadian curricula, as well as being the director of education at MediaSmarts. That's Canada's venerable center for digital and media literacy. We also have with us today, the multi-talented Dave Meslin, who wears many hats, including as community organizer and activist. He's the founder of the Toronto Public Space Committee and Cycle Toronto, as well as a best-selling author of Teardown, Rebuilding Democracy from the Ground Up. And joining us from the United Kingdom is Jacob Orvik Stott. Jacob is the Acting Head of Regulatory Futures at the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, where he leads their work to deliver the Children's Code, which you'll hear about, and to develop the ICO's approach to futures and horizon scanning. Jacob, thanks for traveling across time zones, if not across space with us to be with us today. So welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us on this panel. And now let's begin by exploring the first theme, which asks the question, how are children and youth experiencing the digital environment? Keith, to kickstart the discussion, let's go to you first. Maybe you can take us through a little bit of a day in the vir virtual life of a high school student. What kinds of things do you and your peers typically do online in any particular day? Yep, for sure. Um, I guess I can refer to these past few months in terms of virtual learning uh, because we did have two pivots, but a normal day would honestly look like a child or a student will wake up like at 8 a.m., immediately go on their computer because they have to go to class early in the morning. Um, that, that was just the norm for everyone. And then during that same class, they would open up their phones, go through social media, uh, go watch YouTube videos, um, because I'm going to be honest here, that's just how it was for students. They had easy access to their technology, so they always had it around them whenever um, possible. And because of the lack of interaction um, within person with their friends and families, they would just have to subject to continuously being online, whether that be social media or Netflix or YouTube. And if anything, if they did have to go outside, it was for actual um, working, like if you're 16 and over. Thank you, Keith. And uh, I trust that everyone watching today has turned off all those other distractions and are focusing just on our, <laughs> on our words today. It's difficult to compete against all the information available on the global information system. Um, uh, Keith, that's really interesting. Uh, Matthew, let's go to you. For years, your organization has been studying how children and youth experience the digital environment. Can you give us two or three key findings from your most recent research? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that came up in our most recent research um, that really demonstrates the way that young people in general don't really understand the privacy implications of the platforms that they use uh, and the, even the business model, even how these platforms that they use make money, was uh, one of the questions that we've asked in uh, the last few phases of our Young Canadians in a Wireless World study, which has been going on since 2001, is uh, we asked them whether or not they agree with the idea that if a website has a privacy policy, that means it will not share their personal information with others. And of course, that's not true. Um, privacy policy, of course, simply lays out how information collected will be used. But 
uh, still in this data that we're going to be releasing probably next fall, we found that two thirds of the youth we surveyed still believe that that is true. Uh, and that's just slightly lower than it was when we last asked that question in 2014. So what it really shows us is that, you know, even though so much of our research, both our quantitative and our qualitative research, has shown that young people do care about privacy, um, that they really do have strong feelings about it, and they take a lot of steps to manage their privacy, when it comes to collection of data, when it comes to their privacy with respect to the corporations that, of course, control almost all of the online spaces that they use, they really uh, don't have the information that they need to interact as informed consumers. Thanks so much, Matthew. Jane, turning to you, you've been examining the online experience of young girls more specifically. Can you talk a bit about some of the additional online risks or barriers that young girls face from a privacy, safety, and equality point of view? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so um, we've, in our work um, on the Equality Project and its predecessor project, the eGirls Project, um, we've had a number of things that have come through in the research. Um, and, and in our qualitative um, studies, Young people have expressed concern about the ways that the, the current data in exchange for services model of digital communication um, incents them to disclose as much data about themselves as possible. And they, have, they understand that somehow they're being profiled and judged based on categories, even if, as, as Matthew indicates, neither young people nor adults actually understand specifically the processes that are that are underlying um, those sort of algorithmic machinations. Um, and so in the in the e-girls research, girls and young women specifically uh, told us about the difficulties of being in that environment where they were encouraged to share as much information about themselves as possible. And then were bombarded with stereotypical images of beauty, sexuality, and femininity. And emul emulating those stereotypes in their own self-representations online was complicated. On, on the one hand, if they didn't repeat them, they often felt that they didn't get the likes that social media companies have set up as markers of social success. And then on the other hand, repeating them often exposed them to conflict and ridicule. So they've described to us a sort of walking a tightrope situation, which one young woman described to us as a battle to be, quote, pretty and just a little bit sexy, unquote, but of course, not too sexy. So in an unequal world where expressions of gender and sexuality are, are quite heavily policed, getting the balance wrong in their own self-representations and being targeted by acts like non-consensual disclosure of intimate images were understand, understood by many of our participants to have especially dire consequences for girls, young women, and 2S LGBTQ plus youth. Um, so the critical issues um, weren't only what other individuals were doing, but also the degree to which we've set up a privacy disrespecting ecosystem that's aimed more at maximizing profit and created this sort of perfect storm for facilitating judgment, harassment, and discrimination. Thank you for that. And it sounds like fascinating research. We encourage everyone watching to, uh, to go and turn to that after the, after the panel. Um, are there any other uh, comments from our panelists? Would you like to jump in a little bit more about uh, how you uh, think or experience or research showing how young people are experiencing the, uh, the digital ecosystem? I'll jump in quickly. Um, I just want to say that overall, I'm really inspired and feeling optimistic about what the digital world offers youth and what it allows them to do. Um, all these issues we're dealing with today are crucial and there are real dangers that we need to be talking about. But when we talk about how kids are spending a lot of time, you know, on, on, on screen time and limiting screen time, I can't help but think back to the 1980s when my screen time was just staring at the boob tube and watching really bad television for hours. Whereas screen time today is often interactive, it's social, 
and it literally opens up ac activist organizing platforms that allows them to do you know Friday afternoon climate change walkouts. I sure wasn't walking out of school on Fridays in the 1980s or 90s. So there's something really exciting and empowering when the digital world is used properly by today's youth. And I think that's gonna play out really well. Thank you for that, Dave. And, and maybe uh, building on that, uh, that sense of opportunity as well, or, or the, the broad nature of that uh, digital ecosystem. Does anyone have any, any views on some of what takes place in games and maybe uh, the digital, uh, sort of digital worlds, uh, interactive digital worlds that aren't, um, uh, you know, that are, that are much more social than, of course, the 1980s um, Cheers and Threes company after school? For me, it was actually Voltron and G.I. Joe, but those were also classics. You're right, though. When my nephew's playing video games now, he's got his headset on and he's talking to his friends constantly, and they're actually learning teamwork skills. I mean, it's fascinating. Then, then again, they are winning games by shooting people and driving cars too fast through shopping malls. So I don't know. It's a uh, it's <laughs> double-edged sword. Jane, you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm often thought of as being somebody who is um, a little bit too pessimistic about technology, but I think I had to sort of flip it around and say, I think I'm more optimistic about what technology could be um, and just dissatisfied with the current way we've set up the ecosystem um, to, to prioritize uh, profit making. Um, and, and so I think technology um, could be fantastic. And I know kids have all kinds of positive experiences. My interest in really is sort of seeing what's at the foundation and how do we flip that background uh, around um, to make it sort of fully um, autonomy building and equality respecting. Thank you for that. And uh, Keith, only if you want to, I'm going to give you the last word on young people's experience of the digital environment. Yep. Um, thank you. So there are differing experiences when it comes to technology for youth. Some people have really great experiences, some people don't, um, as we've heard um, from the research uh, provided here today. Um, from my own like view and perspective, I've seen technology being used really great from a bunch of great activists and individuals um, throughout my role as student trustee. I've seen people create communities among, among social media to bring people together, to advocate for important causes that they see within the world. And which brought so many people from not even just Ontario, but across the world to really come together and, and amplify that one student voice, which I found really fascinating. But I do believe, as Jane said, that it can be improved um, greatly for technology to really benefit every single student out there and not just one specific group, but every single youth um, that has access to the technology. Um, thanks so much, Keith, for those great, great insights. Let's, let's turn now to the second theme, which brings forth a discussion on the idea of integrating privacy as part of the educational curriculum on digital literacy. Uh, so uh, for many years, the IPC and others around the world have been advocating to include privacy education as part of the broader digital literacy program, including in Ontario's official school curriculum. Um, where are we at on that front? And uh, what could or should Ontario do next to make this happen more consistently across, uh, across the board? I'll put the question uh, first to Yael uh, Ginsler. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Eric. And um, uh, certainly the advocacy uh, has been helpful by the IPC and others. Uh, digital literacy, of course, is uh, a critical skill. It's a cross-curricular skill that we see in our curriculum. And students uh, certainly have multiple opportunities to develop and apply those skills. They do that by learning online, by doing research, by creating their own media works. We heard a little bit um, you know, from Keith and Dave about different opportunities, for example, that students are engaging uh, in the educational setting uh, with technology. Um, and certainly we have created some mandatory learning expectations now uh, in our kindergarten, as early as kindergarten, right through grade 12. Uh, to support uh, digital literacy and more specifically learning about privacy. 
um, as part of that. And it's, um, it's captured in a lot of different places. And uh, I'll start by giving you maybe a few examples just to help sort of bring this to life a little bit. Um, I'd say the first sort of real exposure that students have about learning about uh, digital privacy comes from learning about personal safety at large. And so we start that right uh, from kindergarten um, in the grades one through eight health and physical education curriculum. So this would be a mandatory curriculum for all students. Students start to learn about personal safety topics. And those include things like identifying and preventing or uh, resolving issues around bullying. And that would include cyber bullying specifically. Um, and explicitly, we also look at uh, issues around harassment, uh, which we all know these things happen both in the face-to-face -face and online environments. In 2019, we actually updated our language in the health and physical education curriculum to really even be more explicit and provide more learning around cyberbullying, cybersecurity, and privacy. So all of that has been uh, increased, um, again, from the kindergarten right up to grade 12. So you know, in grade 12, uh, in grade two, for example, when students are learning about personal safety uh, online, they're learning about not sharing personal information. They're learning about checking with an adult about what kind of information you're looking at online and uh, to help you distinguish whether it's in fact true. Um, and we also have resources for teachers uh, for the curriculum. Uh, so they have that alongside of that. So in the curriculum, we really build in teacher prompts. So teachers are asking students things like, you know, what are some things you should be doing to stay safe when you're playing online? So playing games, uh, for example, we've just spoken about that when you're doing searches on the internet, when you're accessing videos. And there's also some built-in prompts which uh, help teachers to understand what is it that we expect of students in their learning. So here we might um, anticipate responses from students about respecting themselves and others when they're uh, using their technology, uh, thinking about their personal safety, when they see a picture or a video online and it makes them feel uncomfortable or confused or unsafe, um, to stop and to tell uh, a parent or a trusted adult uh, right away to, um, you know, we also touch on the fact of, you know, some people in the virtual world aren't who they say they are. Uh, so how do you understand that? And of course, as students grow and develop, those lead to, um, you know, learning uh, around um, trafficking, for example, really important learning that we have in our curriculum on that. So we start at a really early age. It's developmentally appropriate, but we uh, really start around that idea of safety and it builds from there. Uh, by grade nine, uh, just to give you another example in a very different sphere, um, we recently updated the grade nine math curriculum. And there students are learning about data. And in the data strand, they're asking questions about uh, what about large amounts of data? Uh, what are the potential implications of that? What are the consequences of its collection? Uh, how's it being stored? What does it represent? How's it being used? So they really start to unpack those questions even through a math curriculum. So I'm um, happy to go on. I have lots of examples, um, but uh, I'll pause there for now. But it just really sort of brings to life all the different ways uh, that we build those critical thinking skills. Great, thank you, Yael. I'm going to uh, go on the same question to uh, Anthony Karabash, your members who are delivering this kind of work uh, directly in the classroom. For sure, and thanks. Uh, absolutely, that health and phys ed uh, program is leading the way when it comes to matters of privacy. And as a father of four, I witnessed my kindergarten, my sorry, my grade one child go through uh, an, a health lesson that was directed at personal safety. So the educators in the field, the gatekeepers that I would say for this really important matter, um, for the curriculum to have been implemented so quickly and so well, it's just a, it's it's just great to see that. Uh, could it spread through uh, the rest of our curriculum? Of course, there's lots of work to do in all aspects. And right now, as Yale mentioned, it is, it it does uh, get mentioned throughout all the curriculum in the front matter. And what you're looking for, especially in the health and phys ed curriculum, are those prompts, are those examples, and then our educators tend to run away with things, right? So once they start to uh, collaborate with one another and get together and share ideas, um, these moments of learning turn into infographics. Uh, they turn into uh, public service announcements. And a lot of the professional development that we do 
uh, focuses on how do we take that, let's say that prompt and make it real for the student and apply it within the context of their lives. It's not easy. And, and what, we, what we ask our teachers to do and those who take, for example, a course with us or any pr professional development is we, we ask our, our professionals to go to where they are. And because now we have, as the commissioner mentioned, this framework and we have, um, hopefully one day we'll have uh, more regulation around these pieces, um, the students will feel empowered and the educators will amplify their voice and show really that, okay, I just don't know, it's not just the definition of privacy. I'm going to go a little bit deeper now and understand that I have to protect more than just that, you know, uh, the idea that the research shows that I'm wrong about privacy. I have to go deeper. So I'm, I'm, it, it, that is really heartening uh, for everyone to, to see that. We've got work to do. I'm excited to do it. And um, I hope we can do it together. Great. Thank you very much, Anthony. I'm going to turn now to uh, Dave Meslin. Uh, Dave, teaching kids how to be digitally literate as uh, part of their formal education program is one thing. But what about the invisible curriculum, as you've called it? Understanding that educators in Ontario have long been focused on developing students as responsible, democratic, and critical thinkers, how else might we empower the next generation of children and youth to assert their privacy rights and to find their democratic agency when dealing with companies and institutions whose privacy practices can sometimes seem unchangeable? Thanks, Eric. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the invisible curriculum isn't a term that everyone might be um, accustomed to. It describes all the things that, that a, a youth or a student will learn in a school that isn't actually in the curriculum, but they learn it through the way they're treated, the way their teachers behave, the way the administration behaves, the way they're asked to interact with their colleagues, uh, et cetera. And when Patricia started this event by saying, are youth equipped with the skills they need? I think we have to be looking uh, equally, if not, if not even more, at the invisible curriculum rather than just the, the official things they have to learn about data privacy. So for example, I run a national campaign in Canada to lower the voting age to 16. You should all check it out. It's at vote16.ca. And we, um, we had all these masks printed up with the hashtag vote16 on the mask so we could spread our message out there. And I was on an Instagram live with a whole bunch of youth. And I said, we want to get these out there. Just DM me your address so we can mail them to you. And to me, that seemed like a totally normal thing to ask. And all these kids were like, <gasps> you're not supposed to ask kids for their address. That is totally uncool. That's inappropriate. Like they knew that. So in so many ways, kids are way ahead of us on lots of things. Um, they're learning it in school. They're learning it through common sense. They're learning it from their parents. My concern is, will they have the confidence to speak out and assert themselves when the time comes, right? Um, so, I mean, um, you mentioned um, Three's Company before, right? <laughs> and I mean, the premise of Three's Company wouldn't make, wouldn't make any sense anymore. It, you know, it was this uh, Jack Tripper, you know, has to pretend he's gay because his landlord doesn't want um, mixed gender people living together because they're not married. Youth are so ahead of us on so many things. We're like dinosaurs. So what, what, I, wanted, what I wanna make sure is, will they have the confidence to assert themselves and um, I find that in our schools, we actually don't teach those skills. Um, I find that in many ways, we're still in an, in an archaic education system that really teaches kids that being obedient will get you ahead. And in the same, you might have a great teacher, there's exceptions to this, but the general rule I'm still seeing in the education system is in the same way that someone might not speak out against sexual harassment in the workplace, because your employer or your manager has power over you, will you speak out against something in the classroom that makes you uncomfortable knowing that your teacher is grading you? And in the same way, will you speak out against a corporation that is trying to take your data and on and on and on? We can cure bullying, sexual harassment, um, data privacy, and so many other issues by making sure that kids know that they have a voice, that it matters, and that you speak out against those in power whenever you want to, whenever you feel it's appropriate. And I don't think we're teaching that in school right now. 
Thanks so much, Dave. And it's a it's a provocation. I think we'll be probably coming back to it in future in future questions. Um, let's uh, go now to um, Professor Bailey. Jane, uh, what about supporting the online empowerment of girls? Do we have a bigger hill to climb there? Do we need particular approaches along gender lines or along uh, specifically non-gendered lines? What do you think? Yeah, so thanks for that, that question. I, I think probably three main messages that, that we've heard from young people in relation to, to education and di digital literacy. First, don't treat online and offline like they're distinct. That goes back to Dave's uh, dinosaur metaphor. Um, young people live a seamlessly integrated um, existence and that's not something adults always understand. Um, secondly, um, address underlying problems. So education needs to address the systemic roots of some of the problems that we see surfacing for girls, young women, and youth from marginalized social locations more generally. So misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, racism, colonialism, ableism. Um, this is definitely something that our research participants have told us time and again. If you want solutions uh, to be long-term, if you want to proactively educate, you have to go to address the underlying roots that have really been with us throughout history and are, are repeating themselves in, in, digital, in the digital environment. And then finally, really to sort of pick up on something Dave said, young people um, consistently tell us, instead of telling young people uh, what to do and what not to do, how to defend themselves um, exclusively, which can sometimes feel like victim blaming, especially when they really feel many of the things they do, they don't really have a choice but to engage with those digital um, environments or processes. Teach them about their status um, as rights holders, their right to access information, to be free from discrimination, um, and provide them with tools to engage in policy process, in democratic processes, give them opportunities to learn about and critique corporate data collection and manipulation practices, show our commitment as adults to take responsibility for changing the environment we've created for them and to open these opportunities for them to participate as democratic, in democracy as citizens. Thank you, Jane. Um, Keith, now let's go to you. How is this all resonating with you? Is this the kind of curriculum, uh, is this the kind of discussion that you think students would want to hear and learn more about? Um, would it help raise their awareness of online risks? Um, what do you think would help uh, young people, particularly in, uh, in schools, navigate their digital world? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, this conversation highly sparked my interest as well because I am still in school, so I'm learning the same thing other students are learning. Um, and the concerns raised, they're heavily important for students uh, through their navigation in terms of digital learning because they're unaware. They're unaware of the risks um, that are imposed upon them because they, they're just learning to be more engaged within social media, within the technology, within um, even video games that they participate in because there are potential risks that can come from every single type of platform that they may um, come across from. And that's why it's really important for um, educators and also even like at the governmental level to ensure that the curriculum uh, that they're building up, that they're continuously improving and changing for the coming years are in line with the concerns that students um, might be raising or that students might experience uh, throughout their educational learning. Because it's one thing to create a curriculum, it's another thing to actually include the voices of students. Like that could be through um, consultations, that could uh, be through surveys or presentations towards students. Because we can't expect them to start up a conversation when we don't present them the topic at the first place, in the first place. Thank you for that, and a great uh, a great contribution, Keith. And also a reminder that the um, you know curriculum and all these institutional processes take time, but that underlying digital ecosystem that young people are involved with and are innovating themselves and building is is constantly changing, and and uh, and a challenge to keep uh, to keep track of that and involve young people. Thanks, um, Matthew. Let's go to you. What about the role of parents? Uh, what could parents, and I'm asking, this is personal as well as professional, <laughs> Matthew, uh, what could parents of children and teens do at home to model positive behaviors of digital citizenship, including respect and empathy of others online? 
Yeah. It's personal for me too, because I, I'm also a parent of, of two very, very digitally active uh, kids. Um, and you know, our research has found, and it's really important for parents to know this, that parents are the number one source of information for kids on privacy issues. Uh, by a, a factor of two to one over any other source, parents are where kids learn how to protect and manage their privacy. Um, so there are so many different things that we can do as parents that make a difference. Probably the most fundamental is to model respect for privacy by not spying on your kids online. And thankfully, that is something that seems to be less common uh, than it once was. But it is really a, it's a practice that reduces trust there may be some circumstances where closer supervision is warranted, and certainly you don't want to just let your kids go wild from the moment they pick up a tablet, but active surveillance is something that really is harmful to the trust between parents and kids, but it also sends a terrible message about privacy. What else we do around privacy uh, changes as kids age. So with young kids, we really do have to take an active hand in managing their privacy, particularly their data privacy. Uh, for instance, by installing privacy blockers on all of the devices and all of the browsers that they use to limit data collection. But we can also give them at that age quite simple instructions. So for instance, we can tell them not to use the chat function in a game. Um, so if they want to play Minecraft or Roblox or something with friends that they know offline, they can find another channel to connect with their friends, use Messenger or voice chat or something else, and turn off the in-game chat so that people that they don't know can't contact them. As soon as it's practical, you want to model good privacy ethics by always asking them before you post photos of them and tell them, this is where I'm going to post it, or this is where I'd like to post it. This is who is likely to see it, and these are the things I'm going to do to limit who can see it. And so you're not only modeling respect for privacy, you're also modeling the steps that you want them to take to manage their own privacy. As they get older and start to join social networks, that's when it's time to learn together how to use privacy settings on those networks, and to talk with them about how they might solve privacy issues before they happen. Ask them, well, what would you do if you post a photo um, and you later on you decide you don't like it, but people have already shared it, what would you do? It's also important to give them courage to be themselves online. Because what our research has found is that Teens, in particular, are actually too cautious. They're too concerned about their privacy when it comes to posting anything personal or controversial. They really do default to very anodyne things, things that they know are not going to get any kind of negative reaction. But we also know that it's meaningful interactions with people that are the most valuable thing about their time on these platforms. When we talk about positive screen uses, Genuine social use, where you're actually interacting with people in a meaningful way, is one of the four categories of positive screen time. So we do want to make sure that their legitimate concerns about privacy aren't preventing them from being themselves online. And finally, from the very beginning, we need to start an open conversation with our kids about their whole digital lives, including privacy, keep that conversation going. It often happens that parents stop talking to their kids, stop setting out household rules and expectations when kids get into their teens, but it really is important that we keep that going because that's when they start moving into a wider world um, and it is where they start taking more risks. They need to take those risks to learn, they need to take those risks to become independent, but we need to be there not looking over their shoulders but they, we need to be there so they know we have their backs so that they can still have some guidance as they are gaining the independence that they need. Thank you so much, Matthew. Practical and, uh, and, um, and really stuff that we could implement uh, immediately. Also speaking a little bit to that implicit, uh, uh, that implicit curriculum outside the school in terms of what we're all modeling. Um, and we're gonna save up a little time just by going straight to our uh, our next 
uh, theme, which is uh, close and near to our, our hearts at the, um, at the IPC, the role of regulation and non-regulatory means of dealing with these, uh, these issues we've been talking about. Um, Jacob, it's, uh, you've been waiting patiently. I'm very excited to have you with us. I'm gonna put the first question to you. Many of, of the privacy risks uh, facing children and youth uh, these days come from third parties, like social media platforms, educational apps, online gaming companies, behavioral advertisers, these sorts of things. At the UK Information Commissioner's Office, you've recently adopted a UK ICO children's code. Can you tell us about this? We know it's not a law per se, but who does it apply to? What does it cover? And how did you go about developing it? Do you think it's the kind of thing that can in influence responsible behavior among these third party players? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the question. Hello, everyone. Um, so as you've said, Eric, the Children's Code isn't a law in a strict sense, but it does kind of articulate how we expect our law to be interpreted. And crucially, it does have teeth. So if organizations don't comply with the codes, in the worst cases, we can actually find people up to 4% of their global turnover or 20 million pounds, whichever is greater. So same underlying sort of enforcement powers if needed as the UK's data protection or any way. Um, at a very sort of high level, the code requires online services like games, apps, connected devices, websites, obviously, to both kind of ensure and demonstrate to us that the best interests of children are a primary concern when using their data. Um, in practice, it's comprised of 15 standards of age appropriate design. They cover common data processing activities and service design principles such as profiling, transparency, geolocation tracking, nudge techniques, things like that. Um, and we develop these standards through pretty deep and ongoing consultation with industry, design specialists, child advocates, but crucially also parents and, and children themselves. And we heard uh, some really powerful stories, you know, for example, about the fears that children have about being stalked to their local park because their social media account had revealed their location. On the other side of the coin, we heard about how positive and important it is for, for children, particularly, for example, in LGBTQ plus communities to have access to safe and, and private communities online as they kind of explore and form their identity. So the code was really important and it's a sort of flagship thing for us. And um, in September, we actually formally began to enforce the codes. And whilst it's early days, we're already really seeing the impact of it. Um, several major technology companies have announced substantial changes to their children's privacy practices. And interestingly, actually, these have mostly been applied on, on a global scale rather than limited to just the UK. And I think this suggests to me that the code is perhaps an early sort of forerunner for a wider global shift towards greater privacy protections for children. And I think this is sort of broadly backed up by the fact we've had you know, various bodies in, in Canada, such as yourselves, America, Australia, Singapore, and elsewhere kind of reach out to us proactively to discuss our experiences of the code and what they can learn from it. So yeah, in the round, really hoping that this is you know, the start of something bigger and, and a global shift. Great, thank you, Jacob. And uh, we encourage um, folks after the session and not during to, uh, to go and look at the ICOs. Um, uh, experience and some of their uh, some of their background materials on on the code. I think you'll find it very instructive. Um, Anthony, I'd like to to uh, ask you what responsibility do you think that school boards and teachers have for the online education platforms that they're choosing to use uh, and really must use in some ways in virtual classrooms, and to the privacy and security protections they uh, they hold these companies to, as well as if you'd like to sort of respond more generally to what you think is is happening in uh, in the schools and what you've been hearing so far on the panel. Thanks, Eric. Uh, it's a massive responsibility. And I will say in the work that I've been doing in technology integration over the last 20 years, um, it was of the Wild West for quite some time. Um, but that's a tribute to the innovators. And technology and social media platforms weren't quite the same as what they are today as they were 15, 10, seven years ago. What's happening now and what I've been working on throughout the province over the last, I would say, 10 years in particular, is 
trying to stem the flow of the, uh, I would say, the third parties that are flowing in and out of offices. They're coming into board offices and they're making great pitches for software that they think has educational value. Um, and they come in with credentials and they, they put their best foot forward. What happens is, uh, especially in the mid 2000s, it created a, a culture of FOMO within our school system. So without that standardization at the time, it was still, oh, I'm using this particular product. How about this particular product? It was nonstop marketing. I, I myself had been flown out west to Alberta to talk to executives, flown to Cupertino to talk to executives about um, putting the product ahead of the what we call in education, the pedagogy, you know, the reason, the how we teach. Uh, so this was huge. This is a major issue. I, I, it still continues. Uh, we have some standardized tools across the province that are vetted. Um, but this was born out of a lot of work and a lot of heartache. And uh, the idea of protecting our students' privacy, especially their data, is still paramount. And I still think we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Our teachers are, uh, operate and use tools that are provided by their employer. So the employer is the uh, ultimate uh, gateway to which tools are being used in the classroom. And those, those products are managed by very powerful marketing entities. And so without regulation and without standards that are established, it's very hard uh, for anyone who works in a position of responsibility to filter out what's important for education versus what's the next shiniest and new and amazing thing that does the exact same thing that everything else has done before it. Wow, great, uh, great comments, Anthony. And I think it would be good to delve a little further into that. Uh, I wonder if, Yael, if you have any comments about the, um, the role of school, school boards and teachers with these online education platforms or in responding to some of what you heard so far on, the plat uh, on, the, uh, on our panel about what's happening in schools. Sure, I'm uh, happy to respond. Um, so a few thoughts, um, just, uh, you know, picking up uh, on Anthony's comments, uh, the ministry does try to uh, support educators uh, in identifying those tools. So one of the ways that we do that is the Ministry of Education does provide a uh, secure uh, online environment, uh, an online learning management system uh, that we call the virtual learning environment. Uh, we provide that to all district school boards at no cost. Um, and the, uh, the virtual learning environment, um, you know, does of course meet uh, the Government Ontario Information Technology Standards. It's secure, it's password protected uh, as a platform, uh, and it can be used to deliver online remote or blended uh, learning, and it has some digital tools built into that. So uh, that's just an example of, you know, some of the efforts that we're making. School boards are not uh, obligated to use that system, but it is available uh, to address some of the very concerns that have been raised around sort of protection uh, of those learning environments. Um, we also have taken some steps uh, around uh, also just in general cyber protection frameworks. Um, so we are drafting those, those are in development. Um, and with the greater sort of adoption of online tools and apps and resources by educators, there are opportunities uh, to embed greater data privacy obligations uh, for vendors into school board procurement requirements. So that's something that we uh, are looking at. Um, and of course, a vendor management standard is needed in the sector, in our sector, uh, uh, in any of these instances. So looking at that through the oversight requirements of personal and sensitive data will continue to be important for sure. Uh, those are just some of, I think, some of the sort of regulatory pieces uh, that we're looking at. We also recently issued a policy and program memorandum around bullying prevention. So that sort of addresses, like, you know, back to Dave's point earlier on about sort of the, um, you know, the, the non-curriculum curriculum, uh, that happens in schools. And so, of course, the interaction of students day to day uh, is one of those things. And so we do have additional vehicles uh, and levers in that regard. Great. Thank you, Yale. And uh, maybe I'll... Um come back to uh, Dave Meslin. The IPC has identified a children and youth in a digital world as one of our strategic priorities. It will guide our work for the next few years. 
Our goal is to champion the privacy and access rights of Ontario children and youth uh, by promoting their digital, digital literacy and digital rights while holding the institutions accountable for protecting children and the youth that they serve. So what, can, uh, what concrete advice do you have uh, for the IPC? Thanks, Eric. And I love those crazy furry horses behind you. They're really, they're like chicken horses. I love them. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to regulation, as a solution for problems, we have to be very careful. It can be a slippery slope. And I'll give you an example. You know, there's a big push now for um, censorship and regulation of false information, fake news, dangerous information that goes against science, whether that's about climate change or vaccines. I'm double vaxxed and boosted. At the same time, it terrifies me to think that we would put those decisions in the hands of corporations or government. I mean, I don't want government deciding what's true and what's not true. I don't want uh, Mark Zuckerberg deciding what's true and what's not true. I want all of us and our youth to have the critical thinking skills to be able to figure out what's true and what's not true. Um, it's a really slippery slope to say that private companies should be censoring data based on what their internal processes decide is fact or not. <clears throat> so when it comes to privacy regulation, that's similar to me. I don't want I don't want to have privacy regulations so strict that we can't share data that maybe we would want to because you know it's always opt out. For example, I like some of the data that gets harvested from me. I like the fact that when I see ads, they actually ads I care about. It's actually kind of convenient. <laughs> um, what I would love to see, if there's one regulation that, that um, IPC can push forward, would be about the length of these privacy rules. I mean, Eric, you and I both know that when we see the checkbox um, where we have to approve that they're gonna do this and that, the privacy policy, I never read it. Do you read it? I mean, who's got time to read a 10,000 word privacy policy? So the only regulation we need is that these policies should be opt-in or opt-out, whatever. They should be 100 words max. So we can actually read them. But let, I mean, we're all kind of being hypocrites here because we're like, oh, we got to teach kids how to read the privacy policy as if any of us have ever done it. So this all goes back to invisible curriculum. We need we need tiny privacy policies that all of us have the capacity to read. And then we need to give kids actual leadership skills to know that they should read it, make up their own minds, use critical thinking and decide what they want to do for themselves. And again, with all due respect to the EIL and everyone in the education sector, I don't think we're teaching those skills. Um, I have an article in this month's Alberta Views magazine where I talk about civics education in Canada. And I interviewed students in Alberta to find out what types of leadership skills they are being taught. And I was told about leadership classes. And I was like, oh, what's a leadership class? And they're like, oh, the administration handpicks all the cool kids to be in this class, which is like, the House of Lords model of leadership, or one of them said, oh, I once got to read the news in the morning over the PA, and I was like, oh, cool, did you write the news? And he's like, no, it was just given to me in a script, which I read. These aren't leadership skills. We're, we are actually teaching all the opposite skills that kids need to learn how to find their own voice, be, be critical thinkers, um, trust their own voice and exert that voice. So again, okay. it all comes back to invisible curriculum. I can't, I can't stress that enough. Th thank you, Dave. And uh, these horses can actually at attest that I set aside three or four weeks uh, every uh, every year to read all the privacy policies. Actually, um, and doesn't everybody? I'm pretty sure we all do. Uh, the um, uh, let me go to Jacob now. Uh, Jacob, you're in the position of the of the regulator. The the uh, ICO in the UK has a jurisdiction with respect to, to um, private uh, private sector actors, um, and uh, uh, and also the uh, government institutions. What advice would you give us for our priority on children and youth in a digital world? Yes, yeah, so I think um, the code comes from a position really that online services need to do more to design their services to meet children and parents where they are, rather than kind of focusing on trying to raise all children and parents' digital literacy to a level of literacy that the platforms currently kind of expect of them. And um, that's not to say that, you know, digital literacy isn't important, just that it's probably unreasonable to expect to educate children and parents to a level where they're able to read, you know, 100 pages of legalese to understand a privacy policy. Um, no offence, Eric, I know you said that you like to 
do that on a yearly basis. Um, so the code includes specific standards, um, the children's code that is, that ensure privacy information and also the tools available to children and parents to exercise the digital rights are age appropriate and accessible. So first bit of advice really is demand better transparency where it's needed at source. Um, beyond that, I have a sort of second related bit of advice, if I may, um, which is to kind of go further and to show and prove to online services that such design is both possible and beneficial. Um, throughout the code transition period, we hired design specialists and we worked with design agencies to produce design artifacts workshop templates, examples of what good and bad looks like, to encourage and create a conversation about what good looks like for transparency design and stuff like that. And uh, to finish on a kind of shameless self plug, uh, we did actually win an Irish Design Council Award for that guidance. Uh, I mentioned that to say that that shows that this is needed and it's valuable, not just to say, you know, applaud myself. And uh, we will be producing more guidance in this area of design including things like design tests and metrics so that services can test whether their designs actually work and things like that so yeah a couple of bits of advice there but primarily demand better transparency from online services rather than expecting too much from from other stakeholders thank you jacob i think now i i'd like to go back to keith um keith you've heard uh the uh you know, our panelists on regulation, on what's happening in schools. Do you have any reaction at this point? Yeah, I do. Thank you for asking. Um, in terms of the regulations for youth, I, I do agree with many points that were brought up um, to protect youth, first of all, but I do think there should be an emphasis placed on teaching youth, like the necessary skills to actually make the decisions themselves. Um, instead of like, continuously like placing restrictions, we should be proactively um, educating students to make like insightful decisions um, to ensure that they make decisions based on their safety and what's good for them. Because we should be ensuring that we're educating students to, to grow more uh, with, their, with their mindfulness, to grow more um, with their attentiveness on what's in front of them or, or the potential risks that uh, may involve of pressing this button or um, signing up for this um, sort of subscription, uh, that those sort of situations, we should be allowing students to basically grow within the environment so that they can adapt to the more complex situations that they may be put under. Because placing restrictions is, um, can be beneficial, but it can also just tell the students like, oh, we don't trust you enough to do this, or we don't trust you enough to do that. So that's like the main messaging behind it is that we have to ensure that students are given the opportunity to learn and to grow while also ensuring that their safety is put at the forefront of any decision that is made like to place these sort of regulations in mind. Keith, you're raising a really important and I would say even subtle, uh, bringing a, a, a sort of subtle set of issues together uh, in a really helpful way. We have, of course, the... Uh, um, understanding of vulnerabilities, but also the need for trust and experimentation and uh, young people, uh, children and youth growing into their evolving capacities as, uh, as uh, democratic citizens and as participants um, who are helping to make these environments. I, I wonder whether uh, any other, uh, so I'll open the, our, I'll open the, the floor to all panelists to, um, go further on that, or maybe uh, this is your chance also to respond, uh, disagree, and engage with anything that you've heard uh, so far from the other panelists uh, um, so far. So who would like to go first? You, I think I see uh, Jane Bailey. Jane. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so so really, really great points from everyone. I really appreciate um, Keith's uh, comments around um, around the importance of focusing elsewhere if we're thinking about restrictions instead of restricting young people. Um, the one, I guess the one, the one issue that, that we've been thinking about quite a bit is around this issue of consent. And, and especially as we enter into this um, environment where um, data is being processed in such complicated ways um, through algorithms that have implications, not just for the individual that's consenting, but for broader groups of people, including their friends. 
um, I, 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 I have a concern about whether um, one, we could actually express in privacy policies exactly what's happening so people could be making a decision in an informed way. Um, and, and secondly, whether we might not then want to be thinking about situations where we do need to impose limits, not on young people, but limits on what it is that corporations are, are allowed to do in terms of collection and manipulation uh, of data. And so I, I think the UK model is a really, is a really interesting one. Great. Thank you for that. And maybe I'll turn over to Anthony. I see you've got some points. Thank you. Um, first, an invitation to Dave. I will take you around our amazing province and I will show you that you can be happy with our some of the work that our teachers and educators are doing around leadership. I promise I, I won't disappoint you. There is some good work. We got work to do for sure, Dave. I, I totally agree. But man, you I want to show you what we got. So I'm going to make sure we connect afterwards. All right. Um, I think I think the key is, uh, there are a couple of keys for us to understand. You're, you're asking a family, a teacher, a student to stand in front of um, what one company spends annually, uh, around $40 billion in persuasive technology. And so from the academic side of things, uh, we talk about the importance of standing against it, but we don't market like they do. Uh, we're not as attractive in the digital realm. And that's why I was so encouraged to hear about design in the UK. Because design is, I think, the answer to so much design and marketing. And if we continually ignore uh, that they are being bombarded, but we keep taking the high road saying, well, we'll educate them, we'll educate them. We can educate them with tact and we can educate them with knowledge, of course. But we have to approach it almost in a way that they approach it, okay? It's every 10 seconds, every millisecond, they are the product that's being sold and they are being, I will say, attacked by an algorithm that wants to turn a profit. So my advice to the IPC and my, is, is, is around, if you have good literature, if you have good resources, push them out relentlessly, meet, every, meet your audience wherever they are, that's my first piece of advice. My second piece of, of advice is don't proceed without us. Uh, get everybody, all the stakeholders at the table. Uh, I'll say, yes, I work for an association. I'm here talking about teachers and all educators in Ontario. It doesn't matter who they are. When they're in the schools, those kids go to a caring adult when they need help. We have work to do around power structures and equity. Absolutely. Absolutely. But right now, we need to arm those people within those walls with something to lean on. They have to be able to lean on something to say, I can help you because I have this knowledge. And maybe regulation isn't the answer, but certainly an establishment of standards. And the commissioner mentioned a framework. Well, so let's get that framework out there. Let's build standards that are accessible to everybody. And if it comes down to a student or child reading a privacy policy that they understand, but if it comes down to the idea that if they don't say yes, they don't get to use the service, we have other problems we have to deal with as well. So there's a whole strategic piece we got to look at, especially when we're dealing with, like I said, it's one company only that spends 40 billion on research and development for persuasive tech. That's just one. So we've got some work to do. Thanks. Anthony, thanks. And you're raising this, this thorny issue about, uh, about platforms that essentially become mandatory utilities and ways of interacting with our public, with our public institutions. Uh, Yael, um, I turn the floor over to you. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, sort of want to pick up on Anthony's comments about the good work that's happening in our education system. And you know, while, you know, we're using the levers that we have and there's more work to do for sure, um, you know, I think I just wanted to pick up on that and say, you know, earlier Matthew talked about, you know, teens and when parents start to back off a little bit on their social media use. And so, you know, one of the things we picked up on uh, in the grade 10 course, there's a mandatory course on career studies. 
And one of the things that we picked up on there was, again, around looking at your presence in social media and the impacts of that presence over time on your both educational career and sort of life uh, opportunities. And so what, you know, we go through things like, you know, protecting your, you know, information, like your social insurance number and, you know, things like that. But we really then get into this idea of, um, you know, passive digital footprints versus active digital footprints. And where does that leave you as, a, you know, as a, as a citizen? So uh, certainly on the leadership, I think uh, student voice, uh, lots of uh, work that's happening in schools around that. Um, and we're still trying to uh, pick up where we can in the curriculum on helping students understand their privacy rights and their responsibilities as they currently exist. Um, you know, and that's, those are sort of the levers that we have and would echo Anthony's point, more work to do for sure, uh, and opportunities that lay ahead that we're looking at, um, but wanted to sort of echo some of the good work happening in schools. Thanks. Let me turn to, uh, to Matthew. Matthew said so many interesting things about uh, surveillance and trust and, uh, and how children and youth negotiate their, uh, their digital worlds. Take us a little deeper into it. Sure. You know, I, I really want to reiterate that all of the research shows, ours and research done around the world, that young people do care about their privacy um, and they want to learn more about it. Uh, we found again and again being able to manage their privacy is a selling point for them in choosing what platforms they use. Uh, and that, that is a really important uh, point to make to the platforms, um, that this is something that they do care about. It is something that will drive how and whether youth use a platform. And we've also found that when young people are made aware of the possible implications of privacy risks, whether that's personal privacy issues like photos or data collection issues, they're strongly motivated to take action. But we've also found in our most recent research that we still need to do a better job of supporting them, both in the home and in the classroom. In 2013, one in six students told us they'd, used, they'd learned how to use privacy settings on social networks from their teachers. In our most recent survey, data collected last year, that's risen to one in four, which is an improvement, but a small one. But in 2013, a quarter of students told us they'd learned about data collection in school. And last year, despite all of the educational efforts from MediaSmarts, from IPC and other organizations, that number has not changed at all in the past eight years. It's still just one in four students that tell us they've learned about data collection in school. We know young people are actually subject to more data collection online. They're more surveilled online than any other group. So we really need to do uh, more to help them manage the impacts of that collection. And the, those impacts could follow them for years or decades or their entire lives. Thank you. And uh, Jane, would you like to add anything in at this point? Uh, no, I, I, the, the, the only thing I would reiterate, I really want to um, sort of pick up on something that Anthony said, um, and it goes to that point around, around consent. Um, again, because um, if you're if if you as an adult or a young person are in a situation where there is a, something that you have to use, um, and young people repeatedly tell us they don't really understand themselves to have a lot of options about whether they're going to use some form of social media, for example. Um, if you don't really feel either either specifically because you're in school and you have to use the app to get your work done, you can't say no. So what's the point in telling you what the privacy implications are if you don't have a right to say no to it? Um, but even if you're in, in a social setting where you understand your, your, your social status and your, your, the health of your social networks depends on using particular apps, um, again, like, you, you know, you can, you can, we can read a policy, you're not going to be able to negotiate the terms of that policy, you're not going to be able to change the terms of that policy. So in effect, kids sort of say, well, why, why would I, but what could I do if I read it, right? Um, I, I need to, I need to have access to this app to do X, Y, or Z. So that's kind of the conundrum we, we sort of find ourselves in between, obviously, 
respecting the knowledge and agency of young people um, and, and educating them and providing them with the tools um, to, 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 make great, to make good decisions. Um, but on the other hand, recognizing that we are in an, in, we have created a digital ecosystem that is specifically designed to, to limit their, the, the reality of whether they can choose to do something um, or not. Thank you for that, Jane. And I, I'd like to um, go back to Keith. Keith, I'm going to ask you a sort of specific question about um, uh, what you're hearing from your uh, your colleagues, your peers, about being on camera, uh, being in these digital spaces where you're uh, you're doing learning. And um, and one of the questions is, are you on camera or not? Is your camera on or off? Is it creepy or is it just part of being in uh, in a working classroom? There are many special cases when it comes to cameras for schools because it can honestly vary from class to class. I know some teachers would require like turning on your camera for learning because it provides more engagement, but I don't think it should be something of like a mandatory sort of rule because there are special situations for students where the environment that they may be in shouldn't be uh, like inside with for other students because it's like a lack of privacy or they're, they're not comfortable um, turning it on. Um, but in my experiences and what I've been hearing from students is that they usually turn on their cameras for teachers that they feel it need, needs that engagement because um, <laughs> without that engagement, then it's just silence. It's just silence and then just watching like videos on on YouTube on just someone else speaking because the, the teacher doesn't have any engagement from their class uh, because whenever they ask questions, there's just crickets, like that cricket background noise that you can pull up from YouTube, like that sort of thing. Um, but I do think that it should be encouraged for students to turn on the cameras because it is a, a special case that we have here with um, the learning that we currently um, install for our students because without that camera session, the teachers are just speaking to a wall. They're just speaking to a wall, which honestly isn't the best case. But um, as I said previously, is that there are special situations. So students have to um, adapt to whatever that they feel is most comfortable for them um, within their home. Thanks, Keith. And uh, I can, I can uh, just imagine that some of those teachers might uh, really appreciate it if you voluntarily uh, show yourself sometimes in, in classroom. It takes a great degree of confidence to speak to the, uh, to the empty, empty screen. Um, I think Dave, is, I would like to raise some points. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the, on the, the invisible curriculum and leadership stuff. It's really complicated. And, and I have no doubt that they're doing a better job now than they did when I was in school or when you were in school, every generation gets a little bit better at this. My parents remember getting smacked on the hand with a wooden rod. Um, that wasn't happening in the 90s. So, you know, little baby step there. But what I'm saying is that if we really opened up our imagination, we could, we could perceive completely different ways of introducing kids to concepts of leadership and authority. Um, for my book, Teardown, I actually visited democratic schools in the US where kids actually participate in running the actual school, not running for student council, all the cool kids. And then the only mandate they have as a student council is to organize the annual school dance or whatever, but actually participating in real leadership and trusting them with that leadership at a young age. And I can tell you, Eric, these kids were way had higher emotional intelligence, more confidence and less bullying because they didn't see themselves fitting into a hierarchy where they let out the stress of being um, managed by their teachers that they felt that they needed to manage someone underneath them. There was just mutual respect all around. So again, no, no intent of disrespect towards the great leadership programs that are happening across the province, but we could be doing 10 times better. And we have to just completely reimagine what the role of education is and whether we're giving kids the skills they need to understand that they have their own unique voice and it's always appropriate to express that voice. Uh, thanks, Dave. You keep on raising uh, the issue of power and speaking of, uh, of power, I'm really interested, Jacob, uh, what kind of pushback you might have got from 
regulated uh, parties when you're doing this work on a, a children's code. Some of these uh, companies not being powerless in this digital ecosystem at all and carrying many of the cards. Yeah, yeah, it, it's an interesting one. I'd, I'd say a helpful analogy would be the seven stages of grief. Uh, it sort of started when the code was just a concept uh, that may or may not happen as a bit of anger, a bit of sadness. The main source of discontent, I'd say, was about the idea that the code may create new laws or new principles that are quite far removed from the existing legal framework. And there was an attendant discussion about whether it was right for the ICO or anyone to, to be making such, such a law. I have to say, by the time that the code came around, and in particular, just before the beginning of the one year transition period, um, which was a period of time to give us and the regulated entities time to prepare before we formally enforced it, they had reached that sort of acceptance stage. Um, and uh, I think we deliberately took a very open approach to the transition period where we asked them where remaining uncertainty about the requirements were. We asked them what their needs were in terms of guidance. We asked them in quite a blunt way if they did or did not plan to comply with some of the standards and things like that through independent research. Um, and so using that picture, we basically were able to assuage a lot of concerns, do a lot of targeted engagement and just generally move the dial on some of the standards to the point where by the end of the transition period, a lot of, particularly some of the larger companies are sort of proactively emailing us saying, look at what we've done. Isn't this cool? We'd be happy to sort of share it with others and things like that. So I think now uh, they, you know, a lot of organizations actually realize that the value of some of the more principles based standards in the code, because they can aspire to something and they can interpret it in their own way, rather than having sort of rigid rules, um, which is really positive. So yeah, it's, it's been a journey, but, but a good one for all involved. I think. Well, and we're looking forward to learning, uh, to following and watching that journey more. There's so many interesting um, uh, developments, for example, how to, uh, you know, the trade-off between um, surveillance uh, versus having to identify that a person is or is not a child in order to implement a regulation or a code. Um, it's uh, not a simple privacy space, and it's exciting that you're pushing out into it as a, as a showing some leadership. Um, we are at uh, 1057 right on time due to the excellent time management and really getting to the point of our panelists, uh, which I appreciate very much. I think at this point, I'm going to uh, encourage us all to take a uh, five minute break, uh, a chance to uh, stand up, stretch and uh, move those pandemic bodies, come back at uh, well, we'll give ourselves an extra two minutes. We'll come back at five minutes after 11 o'clock. And uh, when you come back, please come back right on time uh, to our audience because audience questions are is, is what's up next and there's some great ones. So we'll see you at five after 11. Hello and welcome back. Uh, what a great panel session so far. I certainly learned a few things. I hope you did too. We're now gonna open the floor to some questions from our audience. Uh, and remember, we have almost 1000 people joining us today. We really appreciate you being with us. Um, we're calling this a lightning round. Panelists will have about a minute each to respond. It's a, it's a uh, tough task, but I know they're up to it. Um, so our first question from our audience is, uh, what is the most compelling and convincing messages and tactics proven by concrete research that parents and teachers can use to help their teens make responsible choices when it comes to online activities? Great question. Uh, why don't I turn it to Jane uh, Bailey first? Thank you. Yeah, so number one, um, I would always say um, is, uh, is familiarize yourself deeply with the uh, website of Media Smarts um, and all of their resources. Um, it is phenomenal and a global leader on this topic. Um, the other things I think are really summaries of things we've said, teach kids that they're right holders, give them, um, support them to develop leadership skills so they can become engaged citizens talk to them instead of monitoring them um, in order to build trust um, and provide them with tools for critical thinking, walk the walk, be a positive role model yourself. Um, 
implement responses in situations of privacy breaches, such as non-consensual disclosure, implement responses that drive home the nature of the harm and the extent of the impact to the breacher. That's something that, that young people have told us time and again as well. So, so young people can learn to understand um, very clearly the impact of, of those kind of actions. But I definitely would defer to, to Matthew on all of this because he's the expert. Well, Matthew, over to you, a strong endorsement for you and the organization's resources. Yeah, well, thank you. And obviously, I covered a lot of this um, when I was talking earlier, but I did want to say specifically around parents that one thing our research has shown consistently is that uh, there is a strong connection between having rules in the home about how kids behave when using digital devices and how kids actually behave. In other words, household rules do seem to make a difference, and they do even with teens. Um, and you know, my my older son has just just turned thirteen a little while ago, so I know that for parents of teens, it may seem like what we say goes in one ear and out the other, but in fact, it really does make a difference. But it's also important to point out that the reason why rules make a difference is not generally because kids are concerned about punishment. And in fact, you don't necessarily even need to have punishments attached to rules. It is mostly because rules are a way of communicating the values and the ethics that you want your kids to live by. Um, particularly with teens, uh, they're not motivated by fear of consequences or fear of punishment, um, but they are motivated by right and wrong. Uh, and that's why modeling uh, behavior yourself is so important because of course that sends just as powerful a signal. Um, as Jane was saying, if, if you walk the walk, if you lay out clearly, this is how I expect you to behave. This is how I expect you to manage your own privacy. This is how I expect you to respect other people's privacy. Then if you also follow those rules yourself, then that is sending such a powerful message. But of course, the most important rule, what we say is rule number one, is to tell your kids to always come to you if they have a problem um, and promise them that you're not going to overreact, that you're not going to take the device away, you're not going to shut down their account, um, that you're going to work with them to help find a solution for the problem. And that brings us to the other thing that we can do as parents, and that is to be lifelong learners with our kids, because we are all learning these things together. These are technologies, platforms, risks, and concerns that were not around when we were growing up. And so being learners together is a great way of empowering kids. It's a great way of sometimes learning things we didn't know. And it also helps us to understand why it is these platforms and tools are so valuable to our kids and to help them get the most out of them. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, I'm gonna go first to a Yale on the next question from our audience. Um, with the onset of COVID and the move to online learning, if you could give educators one piece of advice uh, to pay attention to when it comes to safety for them and their students with online education, what would it be? And I think I'll join to that another, something else that's coming in from the audience, a question about uh, you know, how, these, um, how, we, how educators and parents might think about these third-party platforms that now seem to be built into the relationship between the student and the, and the schools and that continue uh, following the student after, uh, after school time as well. Sure. Um, well, first, let me say, I think uh, what we saw uh, during the pandemic was really a tremendous uh, amount of adaptability and flexibility on the part of our education system to really respond to the impact of the pandemic. Um, in the education system, of course, our core efforts have been focused on trying to mitigate uh, the learning disruptions uh, and providing a continuity of learning during this time. Uh, in addition, of course, to all of the, uh, you know, priorities around keeping students and educators and their families uh, safe uh, during this time. 
Um, and we've done that in a number of ways. Um, you know, we made a number of educational resources available to educators so that they were readily available, uh, both to educators as well as to students and families. When we go right back to sort of the first closures in 2020, um, and students uh, had to immediately pivot and learn from home. So we tried to make a lot of digital resources available uh, right off the bat and have kept that up. And we've done webinars with over um, you know, 35,000 educators in the province to help them understand how to use our digital platforms and those digital resources. Uh, I mentioned earlier um, our learning management system. I think that's one place that educators can go uh, and feel that it's a, a fairly secure environment there. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's one place. Uh, boards also have other platforms uh, that they procured uh, with the same types of, uh, you know, privacy protections, uh, cybersecurity built in. Um, certainly, uh, you know, and, and these are things, you know, in addition to the curriculum, which of course is that place where educators can help build those skills of students. Um, I really like the comment, uh, Matthew's comment about learning together. I think that is definitely something that uh, happens equally uh, at home between parents and, and their child, and it happens in the classroom between educators and students. Um, because there will, at times, uh, you know, they'll come across something uh, and learning together about why is that inappropriate um, and what are the consequences of that behavior and the impact that it has on others. And so that's the live learning. Uh, that happens in classrooms all the time. Uh, and that's, you know, that educators take advantage uh, of those in the moment, uh, teachable moments. Great, thank you, Yael. Uh, Anthony, I'll ask uh, you the same question about uh, COVID online learning and those uh, platforms as intermediating the experience. Sure, thanks, Eric. And thanks to the audience member for the question. Listen, uh, yes, educators, teachers across Ontario were able to adapt to the situation, but make no mistake, it took its toll. Like it, 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 it's uh, exhausting for everybody, um, but that pro this profession uh, rebound as quickly as it could and learned along the way as they are lifelong learners. And I love that Matt brought that up in his comment. So I think the things that we need to pay attention to um, start with support. So let's support what's happening. Let's acknowledge that we've come so far, but let's support what happens next uh, through messages of support, through uh, professional development, and through respect uh, for all the work that's being that's being done. If we don't acknowledge that there's um, that some currency has been spent and some of us haven't any left, uh, then we start off on the wrong foot. I would, also, I would also say to my uh, teachers, colleagues, and anyone in education across the province, take your time, pay attention to yourself. Uh, there's so much going on and the onslaught of the new and shiny isn't going to stop. And it's very difficult uh, to navigate through that. None of it is spectacularly new. There's a huge difference between improvement and innovation. And we throw the word innovation around a lot when it really is just the same product with a different cover. So take your time, learn what you want to learn because educators and those people that are in front of our children are our most incredible resource. They know what's best for what that student needs. It's not somebody who's going to come in and talk about the next best app that's going to provide the best analytics on whatever they're learning. It's the person who's standing in front of them every day from, from between an hour and a half to six hours. Okay. And, and last, I want to say uh, to, to everyone in education is don't be afraid to say no. And we talked about this. We need to see examples of what it's like to, to stop something that you know isn't right. And if, if third party vendors are coming in and this, on, this continuous onslaught of uh, technology um, doesn't abate, we have to see examples of the defenders out there, the gatekeepers saying, no, this doesn't meet the needs of the classroom and it's not pedagogically sound. Thanks. I'm going to switch up our, our order a little bit, and um, maybe I'll go to Jane, uh, uh, to you right now. We had an interesting question uh, come in that might need some explanation from you about the uh, Supreme Court's decision in Jarvis and what it means for children and youth in education, uh, in secondary education, but also maybe afterwards in, uh, in colleges and universities. 
Yeah. So, so the Jarvis decision was a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, it involved a, um, a high school teacher from uh, London, Ontario, who had been surreptitiously uh, taking images of the uh, breasts of his uh, of some of his students in the school and in public split in public spaces in the school. Um, and he was ultimately charged with and, and ultimately convicted of, of voyeurism. Um, and so one of the things to know about voyeurism as a, at the crime itself is that um, it, 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 it it's relates to surreptitious recording. Um, so recording that is made in circumstances where um, maybe there's an attempt to cover up or to not reveal um, that uh, that the recording is happening. It also it also typically relates to um, to situations involving sexual purposes or or uh, revelation of um, body parts or activities that tend to be associated with sex or sexuality. Um, now, in terms of the, the 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 probably the most important thing from a privacy perspective about the Jarvis decision was it made very clear that students um, have uh, not just students but everyone has rights to expect privacy even in places that are understood to be public, and that includes in the corridors in school. It includes in classrooms. Um, and the, the Supreme Court of Canada gave us a very, um, uh, I think, carefully crafted sort of set of criteria and factors for thinking about when um, privacy is engaged and when any particular activity sort of goes too far um, in terms of in terms of infringing on on the privacy rights. In, in this case, I think, in the context of this question of of, of students. Um, and so um, the, 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 the findings of the decision are specific to the offense of voyeurism, but the part of the decision that talks about privacy is really important for, for everyone to be thinking about in terms of, um, in terms of uh, student rights, in terms of um, the, the rights of, of educators, especially in environments where we're, we are using digital platforms that, that enable recording. And so I think it, it's actually important for all of us to be thinking about just because, you know, kind of goes back to some of the things Anthony has been saying, just because a technology gives us the capacity to record, does that mean necessarily then we should be recording? And what are the implications of that recording, especially in an educational environment for the willingness of, of students to actually participate in the discussion, knowing that uh, now, a, now a digital record has been created of what has happened in, in that context. So I think it's a, it's a sophisticated decision. It, 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 it it's super important for all of us to be thinking in this era of the of in growing and growing capacity for recording and digital memori memorialization of all of our interactions, you know, including this panel today, um, about the implications uh, for the privacy rights of people who are are involved in those interactions. Thank you for that, and uh, I'm going to move to. Uh, to Keith, a surprise question. This is uh, building on questions from the audience here. Um, do you have any Do you have any thoughts for us about, uh, you know, um, moving or supporting uh, children and youth into positive um, uses of social media, and uh, or dealing with some of the challenges that they face on social media? That's a very excellent question. Thank you so much um, to whoever brought it up. But in terms of social media and the use of uh, or teaching youth to lead more towards the constructive use of social media rather than um, sort of the fan-based popularity. I do recommend that educators or um, anyone who's teaching students itself to promote this sort of positive experience that can build upon confidence, that can strengthen relationship, increase awareness of a student's um, mind is much more of a better path in terms of using social media because you can do this in a variety of manners whether that be um, encouraging students to follow or share inspiring stories about individuals or advocates um, and also connecting with friends and family and not just posting for the sake of 
of just getting some sort of validation from other individuals because you don't need to get that validation from someone else. You just need to have or spend your time the way that you want to spend it on social media, whether that be um, posting, I don't know, a random update that you went to a cafe or that you or you were with your friends um, after not speaking for like a few months, like that sort of um, experiences is really great for you to promote. And overall, just finding out that balance between staying on social media and also focusing on what's in front of you is really crucial. Uh, the, this world that we call technology. So take time to connect with your loved ones, not only through technology, but also through face-to-face -face interactions because they're really important in one's um, development as a child. And honestly, like all of these tips will just be mind of, will help students and youth be mindful of what's real and what's also important to you in the long run. Thanks for that, Keith. And I have to say, as someone who is moderating a panel and looking at, uh, at chat and questions and, and notes, I'm starting to really appreciate the cognitive load that, uh, that students face in, a, uh, in an online uh, uh, teaching environment. Uh, I have a lot of admiration for uh, what you're working with. Um, I'd like to go to a really a great question that came in from our audience. Uh, again, close to the IPC's uh, own uh, interests and focus. If Ontario ever adopts its own private sector privacy law, and we know that uh, BC, Alberta, and Quebec have them, Ontario does not, uh, should children and youth have their own specific protections? What might those look like? Jacob, you're in a great position to answer this uh, from the ICO doing that work in the UK. Uh, well, the obvious answer is it should look like the children's code, of course. <laughs> but, uh, beyond, beyond that obvious answer, I think um, it is really important to acknowledge that children and young people do have specific needs and they are developing, but at the same time, we shouldn't necessarily infantilize them. So yes, safeguards important, protection's important, but we need to acknowledge that they've got a whole suite of other rights and they have agency in their own right. So if I could give one bit of advice, it would be to also acknowledge the positive role that private sector technologies can play in children's lives and to not inadvertently shut off the positives as well and to ensure that online services and private sector organizations create their services in a way that gives children and sometimes for a certain age their parents genuine sort of agency and control rather than the illusion of control um, which sometimes is what happens with the sort of current state of play so yes to safeguards but also acknowledge that children have agency and and give them the tools that they need to, to use that agency thank you uh Jane, you have a, if you have a quick word on this, and then I'd like to go to the commissioner for a, a, a response to this question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, my, my thinking is um, that, that we need this combination of we need to educate, but we also need to regulate. Um, and, uh, and, and the other plug I want to put in um, is to say, you know, and looking at the wonderful contributions that, that Keith has made to this, to this program, that there should be um, far more engagement of young people in policy making processes, far more. Um, and and uh, I, I highly advocate for that. We're, we're going to be running a youth summit this fall for the Equality Project to engage youth on um, education technologies. Um, and to bring them together with policymakers. And so I, I can't emphasize enough that we should not be stepping forward with policy unless and until we have actively engaged um, young people in that process. Thanks, Jane, and look forward to hearing about the results of that, uh, of that program you're working on. Um, uh, Commissioner Kosame, I'll go to you on, on, this, on this question of uh, what those children, and uh, what sort of child and youth specific protections um, might be worth looking at. Great. Well, thank you uh, to all the panelists. I don't know why my camera is not working, but uh, I am smiling uh, and thanking you all for a, a spectacular um, panel. I just wanted to say uh, that uh, when the Ontario government invited comments on whether or not Ontario should adopt a private sector privacy law, um, and in particular, whether there should be special protections for children, uh, we responded to that white paper and our response, uh, our submissions on our website, but we definitely supported special protections for children, including setting a minimum age of valid consent, although we didn't opine on what that would be, uh, recognizing that below a certain age, it, it is not um, reasonable to expect a valid consent of children. 
Um, but even where there's substitute decision-making of parents on their behalf, uh, give children, particularly mature uh, teens in 13 to 16 years old, the right to object. Um, so it's not just because parents can uh, consent on your behalf. Kids too may object uh, to certain privacy practices. That goes to the whole theme of empowerment today. The other thing we said is it's really important to require private sector uh, platforms and other institutions to be very clear in disclosing privacy risks, but in a way that's age appropriate. And so uh, for goodness sake, let's get rid of those 30 page uh, privacy policies and let's get very, very real uh, with age appropriate uh, uh, disclosure of privacy risks. There should be special prohibitions uh, against online profiling and nudging of behavior. This is um, many countries around the world are starting to prohibit that kind of use um, uh, of children's information and influence on their behavior and their decisions, and we supported that. Uh, we also said there should be a near absolute right for children to take down content that they've posted about themselves and they regret so that they can better manage uh, their evolving identity over time as they mature and uh, grow and make mistakes and uh, learn um, to evolve from those without uh, the past uh, haunting them. And finally, it's really important, I think, for private sector privacy law to be well integrated with a public sector privacy law, which we administer, because you do want to get to those third party service providers, those commercial platforms that interact with schools. We can regulate schools and tell them what they must include in their contracts with third party service providers, but it's really getting to the heart of those providers and regulating their part in the equation that I think could be uh, done much more seamlessly if Ontario also had a private sector privacy law. So on that, I will end. Thank you all. And uh, I think I will uh, hand it over to Warren, our assistant commissioner of uh, dispute um, or of, uh, tribunal and dispute resolution services, our newest addition to the team. Warren, uh, welcome and uh, over to you for concluding remarks. Thanks very much, Patricia. And thanks very much to our audience for joining us today and for coming up with some really great questions. It's very much appreciated. I hope everyone shares what they've learned here today. And for those who were unable to attend, you may let them know that they can watch today's seminar on our website or on our YouTube page. There also will be a blog by the commissioner posted next week with highlights of this morning's event. Now, speaking of highlights, I'd like to close out this morning's event with a brief wrap up of some of the thought provoking and insightful comments from our panel today. Jane Bailey spoke about the very valuable equality project and the messages they have received from young people regarding education and digital literacy. There was an important message that we should not treat online and offline as distinct. Young people live seamlessly in both worlds. But this doesn't mean that limits should be placed on young people. Instead, we need to think about what the purveyors of these apps and services should be allowed to do. We need to provide youth with the tools and opportunities to critique data collection practices and let them participate in democracy as citizens. As our youth panelists, Keith noted just how much students have to be continuously online and connected to the internet to interact with each other, especially during the pandemic. And as much as youth are tech savvy, it's important to educate students to make the right decisions when navigating our digital world. And also to give them a seat at the table in the conversation about what our digital rights curriculum looks like. Anthony Karabash highlighted the challenges that teachers face without any regulation and standards to filter out the digital noise and attractiveness of certain online services for our youth. He also discussed the important role that teachers have to help students make smart digital and privacy choices. And he also raised the concern about putting new education software products ahead of the pedagogy and the need for standardized platforms that put student privacy first. Yale Ginsburg provided us with good information about the 2019 updated education curriculum to address online issues, including changes to the health and phys ed curriculum to update students' learning regarding cyberbullying and online harassment. And these are key features in educating our youth about online risks and building critical while enabling teachers to provide relevant information about the privacy risks of our interconnected world. Matthew Johnson of Media Smarts highlighted his, that his research indicates that the youth care very much about their privacy 
and it drives how they use a platform. And when they're made aware of those issues, it motivates them to make choices about how their privacy rights and information are protected. Matthew also made a good point that children and youth learn from their parents more than any other source by a factor of two to one about the importance of data privacy and steps that they can take to solve privacy issues. And parents need to keep those conversations going when children head into their teenage years. It was interesting to hear Dave Meslin speak about the invisible curriculum, highlighting the new social mores among youth regarding information privacy well beyond what previous generations understand and have experienced. And as a result, we need to make sure that kids know they have a voice and they can speak out against power. He also learned that screen time today is functionally different patients. And instead of only the passive watching of screens, today's youth experience screen time is necessarily interactive from social media to cooperative games, which poses challenges for how we view privacy in the digital age. They've also raised the issue of the lack of readable and understandable privacy consents when using services and websites. And finally, it was also interesting to hear from Jacob about the Children's Information Code established by the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK. It was great to hear about the innovations in the regulatory environment to establish an enforceable code of practice for online services that are likely to be accessed by children. We've covered a lot of ground here today with some very unique perspectives. And I'd like to end by paraphrasing the commissioner and that there is a growing convergence around the importance, complexity and urgency of the privacy issues facing children's digital future. And while the issues and challenges may be complex and urgent, we need to engage the widest spectrum of society in order to find solutions that are effective. That means we need to engage everyone from all communities and especially those that are underrepresented and at higher risk from the harms that can be found online. We live in the most technologically connected world in history, and our children will inherit the digital world that we collectively create. And I think it's important that we use our time today to understand how we can best champion the privacy and access rights of children and youth by promoting their digital literacy and rights while holding institutions accountable for pro protecting the children and youth that they serve. And today's youth will also help to shape the future of connectivity, access, and privacy within our society. And with them rests the fate of what will happen to our privacy rights and a, to a transparent and open government, which are cornerstones of our democracy. Now, before I go, I want to encourage all of you to visit our website and take advantage of our resources here at the IPC. And if you look at the bottom of our viewing page, you'll see some links to our resources and a link to a whole web page we've got on children and youth. We also have a number of webinars and a variety of topics in our very popular podcast series, Info Matters, where the commissioner interviews the most interesting and insightful people on all matters of access and privacy. Thanks again for our audience for joining us and for our panelists for participating and making this a great event here today. And on behalf of the commissioner and the IPC, please stay safe and have a great day.